It's great to be with you all today. Hello, everybody. I hope uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, there is uh, peace with you. And uh, just before we get into storytelling, uh, I'm going to begin this session the way that I begin all of my theater work sessions with just a little check in. We're going to take 30 seconds here. Uh, if you're sitting, and you would like to stand for a moment to stretch. If you can't stand, then to just lean back from the screen. And uh, we're just gonna take 30 seconds here to, uh, to be here, to let go of any other worries from the day that are past or coming, and uh, to reflect on, uh, on what you'd like from this session, what your hopes might be for it. Um, this is called checking in. And uh, I'm going to leave you here for 30 seconds with a view of the uh, mountain behind me here in North Wales. Just take 30 seconds for yourself. Thank you. And if you'd like to, to use the chat, you're very welcome to put a word in the chat about how you're feeling in this very moment, or about how you feel about storytelling. The chat box is there for you. Feel, whether you're sitting or standing, feel the ground through your shoes and through your socks or just through your bare feet, feel the ground beneath your feet. And reflect with me, aside from Viv's wonderful session today, when was the last time someone told you a story? Maybe it was recently. Maybe it was last night. Maybe you're lucky. Bedtime stories, right? It goes back so much further than that. I mean, right, right, right the way back to when we really first began sitting around a fire. Storytelling is one of the oldest things that we've done. It is congregation. It is togetherness. Even if it's not physical, through this last year's isolation, it is the way that despite geography, we can share in the woes and the delights of humanity together. That very famous phrase, right? Once upon a time, or as I've been lucky to travel the world and have learned a few phrases on my travels, bilo nebilo. Kdej bolo, tam bolo. Davnim, davno. In dag. Er was eins. Es war einmal. Era una vez. Había una vez. Será una volta. Il était une fois. Mukashi, Mukashi. Un waith a itro. That last one. Welsh for once upon a time. Please, if you have your own, please put them in the chat box. I'll look forward to devouring them later. Talk about a phrase that unites us all. Once upon a time. Storytelling has been with me all the way through my career as an actor and as an educator. I, I suppose I received a sort of storytelling education when I worked with a theatre company called The Liars League, and you can find their work at theliarsleague.com, or it might just be Liars League, I'm not sure. Um, the Liars League is a wonderful outfit. They invite anyone 
to submit to them a story. Uh, the story can be a maximum of 2,000 words long. It has to be written to a particular theme. Uh, so because it's February, this month's theme is probably something like heart and loss or something like that because it's Valentine's Day and Halloween time it would be, I don't know, ghosts and ghouls or something like that. But anyone can submit uh, a story to them. And uh, the, all the stories are anonymized, read by all of the liars uh, who run the company. And then the five best stories are picked. Uh, five professional actors are hired to read those stories out loud in, or perform them really in front of a paying audience uh, every second Tuesday of the month in central London, at least in the old times before lockdown. And for about four or five years at the beginning of my acting career, I read and then hosted this event week in, week out. And I, whenever I hosted, I would always begin the event by asking the audience, when was the last time you were told a story? And it was beautiful because there were people there who had been at the event the month before and they said last month and there are parents who maybe had had a, a story read by to them from their child. But most adults there, their eyes glazed over a little bit as they realized it had been decades for some people since they were last told a story. It seems to strike a chord within us to reflect on that. Storytelling cropped up again in my life when uh, I was asked to run a storytelling workshop for a group of entrepreneurs, a group of genius people who come up with the most groundbreaking, revolutionary ideas, but are not the best storytellers. Now, why do you need to be a great storyteller to be an entrepreneur? Well, I learned in this uh, weekend workshop that these entrepreneurs often have to take their um, staff through something called the change curve. So let's say I am an entrepreneur and I have come up with this amazing revolutionary technology that allows um, uh, kites that you would fly in the air uh, to um, capture electricity and it goes down the line and it solved the world's energy problems. Um, and we're making at my um, kite electricity factory, we are making a fortune in it. Everybody who works there is really happy and they, they really understand how these kites work. But because I'm a genius entrepreneur, I go into the factory one day and say, listen, everybody, we are no longer going to make uh, electricity kites. Um, we're gonna scrap all that. Uh, instead, we're going to make underwater bicycles. Uh, so from tomorrow, everyone is going to make underwater bicycles. Thank you, goodbye. And of course, everybody who works at the factory is apoplectic. They're all upset because they know how to make electricity kites, but they don't know how to make underwater bicycles. And they need to be taken through the change curve. And the change curve goes something like this. When people are supported through a change in direction, uh, they go from, what are you talking about? This is terrible. We make electricity kites. This is never going to work. Oh, well, actually, I suppose we could do something new. Oh, you know what? Underwater bicycles could be a really good idea. Yeah, underwater bicycles are fantastic. And they go from a position or a place of panic through a slow acceptance and to a place of running with this new idea. But it takes storytelling. It takes good storytelling to be able to walk people through any sort of change curve. Now, I've spent most of my life with Shakespeare. And I think a lot of people assume that Shakespeare is a great storyteller. The, he is often being described as the best playwright in the world, certainly one of the best, if not the best English language playwright. Um, but is he a good storyteller? Well, most people will say that there are three things that make a good story. Uh, plot, that helps. Um, 
characters and themes. Plot, characters, themes. But I would add uh, two more to that if we're talking about storytelling. I would add atmosphere and I would add the storyteller's ability to elicit empathy, to bring out empathy in the hearer, no matter the language of the hearer. The idea that communication of heart is the craft of storytelling. Communication of heart is the craft of storytelling. We'll come back to storytelling ability in a little while. In terms of atmosphere, well, you've probably all had great experience this year that uh, web cameras are not very good at transferring empathy and atmosphere through its magic. They are very good at transferring sound and light and words and ideas. They're really good at those things. It makes me think and reflect back to the environment of the performances that Shakespeare was writing for 400 years ago, and what sort of atmospheres he was writing his stories for. If you've ever been lucky enough to visit the reconstructed Shakespeare's Globe Theatres in London, on the south bank of the River Thames, you will have a, a fair idea of what sort of environment and atmosphere Shakespeare was writing for. There are two theatres on the South Bank there that have been reconstructed to as close as we understand the theatres uh, would have been 400 years ago. The first one is outside. It's an outdoor theatre and it has no roof. It has a roof above the stage to stop the actors from getting wet if it rains. But if you are sitting under the gallery, which has a little roof, or if you're standing around the stage, then uh, if it rains, you're gonna get wet. And even, excuse me, even if uh, it's the performance is at nighttime, they light the theater as if it is daylight. Shakespeare's plays would have been performed at about two o'clock in the afternoon, and the modern reconstructed globe mimics that performance time, even at night time, by with its big floodlights all around, and the space is as daylight. Now, what does that do to the atmosphere? You might think that it destroys all atmosphere, but we would think that because if any of us are used to going to the theater in our lives, well, for the last 150 years or so, the norm is to go to the theatre and sit in the auditorium and the lights are on you, the lights are up above the auditorium, and then the show starts to be begins and the lights will go down on the auditorium and the lights will go up on the stage. Now, that means, of course, that uh, you are sitting in darkness. Um, and it also means that as an actor, if I come out on stage as Hamlet, let's say, I can't really see any of you. I might be able to indistinctly make out how many of you there, there might be, but I won't be able to tell uh, whether you're sitting upright or whether you're watching or, 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 or really what your mood is, apart from through some sort of kinesthetic awareness of, of atmosphere that actors train in and get used to playing their audience by sensing the, the general mood. Now, it's very, very different in Shakespeare's theatre, uh, both 400 years ago and today. If I step out on stage at the Shakespeare's Globe, then I can see you all. And of course, you're not sitting if you're standing in front of the, uh, uh, the stage, if you're in the groundlings area, which is a much more active place for you to be receiving a play. But even if you are sitting under the gallery, I can make eye contact with every single one of you. And I can see whether you're happy or sad or yawning or drinking a beer or texting or talking. And I can talk to you. Now, again, reflect that uh, it was only about a couple of hundred years ago that it became normal for 
with the lights down on the auditorium and brightly lit on the stage for an actor to come out as Hamlet and have a speech, let's say, to be or not to be, that is the question, or, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I, any one of these speeches. And because of the bright lights on them, on the actor, and the inability to contact the audience, it became an observational process for the audience to watch the character as they are reflecting on their inner mental state. Thank you very much, Freud. But that's not how it was in Shakespeare's time. In a shared light situation, the character would come out as Hamlet and talk to the audience and ask them, do you think Claudius killed my uncle? Do you think the ghost was telling the truth? What do you think? What do you think? And response was actually required. There are places in Shakespeare's plays in the text where it's clear there is room for the audience to respond. It is very much a two-way dynamic between actors and audience in Shakespeare's time, as it is in the modern theatre, the modern reconstructed theatre. Now that's really interesting because then there's a shared journey. It's not just you sitting in the darkness with your eyes folded, maybe awake, maybe asleep, saying, go on, entertain me if you can. You have to actively listen. You are there with the protagonist. They are making eye contact with you. They're talking to you. And that means you're more likely to feel included. And if you feel included, you're more likely to laugh if the character makes a joke, and you're more likely to cry when they die. The two masks of the theatre, the comedy and tragedy, the two main emotions that theatre is trying, that storytelling is trying to provoke from you. There is an atmosphere of connectedness. There is an atmosphere of togetherness in that shared light environment. Moved to the indoor theatre, the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse, which was finished in 2014 in the Shakespeare's Globe. There's another indoor theatre in the uh, in um, called the Blackfriars Theatre in Virginia, in America. And there's one that's just going to be finished, built in a year or so in the north of England called Shakespeare North. Now, these um, theatres in Shakespeare's time were candlelit. And if you haven't tried and explored and experimented with a storytelling session when your only lighting is either candles or a soft ambient light, I heartily recommend you do so. There's something about working stories by candlelight that brings a hush. You can feel sleepy, but it's not an unfocused, I'm going to fall asleep sleepiness. There's a magic to telling stories by candlelight. It, may, it makes you lean forward. Your eye is drawn to sparkly details in the costume. Your hearing tunes up a notch because there's even with a full complement of candles, the lighting from candlelight can be quite blurry and indistinct. It tunes your ear to the word more. There is a, an intimacy in the atmosphere of candlelight. So he had good storytelling environments and atmospheres to write for. So what about those three qualities of good story that I mentioned earlier, of plot, of character, and of theme? Well, as Janza mentioned in my, uh, the brief for, my, for this session, Shakespeare is not so famous for great plots. There's one play that we're pretty sure he made the plot up for, like it's his own original plot, and that's for a play called The Merry Wives of Windsor which is not a very good play. It's not one of his best, anyway. And as for some of his best, Henry V, Troyes and Cressida, Hamlet, Macbeth, none of these plays are his original plot line. Many, many other playwrights of the time were writing their histories of Henry V or their versions of the fall of Troy. He's not an original plot writer. Characters, though, 
He's pretty good at writing characters. And you may not necessarily know what those characters look like, and I'll come to that in a moment, but they are famous. And they're famous not just for what they say, but the way that they say it, right? I mean, Hamlet and to be or not to be, that is the question. Or Richard III, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Or Othello, I kissed thee, ere yeah, I killed thee. Or King Lear, blow winds and crack thy cheeks. Or Macbeth, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand, come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. His characters, his characters are great. And the themes, well, perhaps this is the thing that makes Shakespeare the storyteller that we love. His themes are universal. Now, dramaturgically speaking, in, as you know, speaking from the point of view of a, of a theatre maker, his dramatic choices are incredible. His balances of comedy and tragedy the big reveals, the twists that he, he turns, they're second to none. Because, of course, Shakespeare never writes a tragedy that's just tragedy. Throughout it are little pieces of comedy scattered throughout. And his great comedies, they're bookended by tragedy. He knew from that Greek persona theatre mask of comedy and tragedy that do not sit separately. They sit just next to each other, cheek by jowl, that if you want to make an audience laugh, Make them cry first. And if you want to make them cry, make them laugh first. Relax them, get their emotions out, and then you've got them. Now, his plots lifted from just good versus evil. He lifted them to way new heights by introducing characters and motives and those themes, wrapping them all into each other to the point where an audience member might be hard pressed, even at the end of the tragedy of Othello, not to feel a degree of sympathy for Iago, that terrible, terrible villain. Or watching the tragedy unfold in Titus Andro Andronicus, Shakespeare's revenge tragedy, and having seen Aaron do the most despicable things, still feeling sympathy for him at the end. He was doing something new with the way that he twisted plot and character and theme together. And, you know, these weren't stories of Little Red Riding Hood, of the, the folk nursery stories that we might have heard when we were younger. Oh, a, a, a little girl um, is on the way to her grands and she has food and a wolf tries to get her. And, and these are quite, you know, generic, I suppose. But Shakespeare's themes, they're not just relevant to childhood experiences you might have had. They're relevant across the country and across the world and across humanity. He was putting the human condition under the microscope. And so his themes are universal. He writes plays about things we've all been through, about falling in love with your best friend's fiance. Has anyone ever done that? Just for a moment? He writes plays about doing anything you can, everything you can, to get that precious job promotion. You fought tooth and nail, yielded what you believe in, pushed someone out the way. He writes plays about people who are so consumed by jealousy, they lose sight of who they really are. He never wrote plays about what it is to be English or British. He wrote plays and stories about what it is to be human and about what binds us all together. A story told by Shakespeare will 
be relevant to you or to someone you know. I love the sonnets for that reason. 154 little parcels of first person life experience bound up in 14 lines. No matter how many times I come back to Shakespeare, to a play or to a sonnet, it bears retelling. And perhaps that's one of the, the markers of successful storytelling, that you can tell it over and over and over, or engage with it over and over and over again, and still leave satisfied. I re-watch Stanley Kubrick's film, The Shining, every year. I know it backwards. And every time I see it, it terrifies me. I suppose that's why I watch it, actually, because even though I know it really well, it can still scare me. I reread William Gibson's book, cyberpunk book, Neuromancer, every year. It was published in 1984. I think I found it when I was 16, and I barely understood it and just about got hold of it in my head and in my heart. And now every time I read it, even though I must have read it three or four dozen times, a couple more than times than once a year, I'm not that old. But every time I read it, I get something new from it. Peel the onion. Join a few more dots together. One of my friends rereads The Lord of the Rings every autumn and finishes the trilogy just in time before Christmas. And, I, and he tells me that that's out of comfort more than anything. That it's familiar, that there is a comforting familiarity to returning to some stories. They can be nourishing because you get more from them or they can just be that familiar blanket. And I get the same thing. Every time I encounter a play, if I've worked on a Shakespeare play before, or as I say, a sonnet, every time I do a sonnet, I get something new from it. I remember the first time I was asked to read Sonnet 116, which you might know because uh, you might have heard it at a wedding. Uh, it's often read at weddings because it's got the word marriage in it, although it's not really about marriage. It's about witnessing love that goes beyond the test of time. It's about witnessing love that doesn't change depending on the day or the moment or the mood that outlasts time itself. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. No, it is an ever fixed mark. Looks on tempests, but it's never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. I must have read that sonnet out hundreds, if not thousands of times, but I have never read it the way I just read it with you now. Shakespeare is often said to be for all time and for all people. But it's because of the space that he leaves. There's no character in Sonnet 116. There's no character in any of the sonnets. There's a first person pronoun, I, and there's often a second person pronoun, thou or you. Storytelling, and this is definitely true with Shakespeare, lives and breathes depending on how much of yourself you're willing to invest in it and how personal you're willing to make those eyes and who you're thinking about when you say the yous and the these. Shakespeare 
leaves so much space for us. Whether you're receiving the story or you're the teller of it, I think of him as having created this beautiful, ornate frame, this golden frame. Imagine it, the most beautiful picture frame you can imagine. It's golden and it's luxurious and it's evidently expensive, but the canvas is blank because that's where you come in as the teller. And if you're playing Macbeth or Lady Macbeth or Hamlet or you name it, one of the reasons why we tell these stories over and over again is because you paint your character onto that canvas in a way that the person next to you or anyone else in this webinar couldn't do because they haven't lived your life experiences. They haven't been through the emotions in the emotional events that you've been through. And when you ingest these words and regurgitate them outwards and deliver them with passion and heart to the speaker, to the listener, sorry, they'll never have been spoken that way before. Shakespeare's characters are often described as being like the yin yang symbol, a half. They're shells. And they're waiting for the other half, you, to fit perfectly in them and bring these characters to life. I think that's one of the reasons why he is a great storyteller. And it's because of the space that he leaves for us. Now, the success of a storyteller really changes. It really depends on the environment, of course. The Globe uh, once took Hamlet on tour to every country in the world, or tried to. And the talkbacks, of course, would change depending on the country that it was performing in. Who's the best character in the play, they might say. And, you know, Hamlet is a play about the, the noble prince who is grieving for his father, the king's death. And then the ghost of his father turns up and says, hey, Hamlet. Your uncle Claudius killed me, he murdered me, and you must exact revenge on him. So usually people support Hamlet. There were countries that the globe visited where in the talkback, the most popular character was Claudius. Because in that country, if you wanted the crown, if you want to climb up, you take it. Of course you kill your brother. Successful storytelling changes country by country and culture by culture. We learned so much about Shakespeare taking our shows on tour to Japan in 2019. I think the most revelatory story perspective that I gained was when we came to the United Arab Emirates in 2016. That the notion of storytelling success depends so much on cultural perspective and opens up questions about intimacy and race. You might know uh, the play Romeo and Juliet, when they first meet, they meet at a dance. They meet at Juliet's father's house party. And Juliet finishes dancing with uh, her suitor, Paris. And just as she finishes dancing with Paris, Romeo apparently sneaks up, he's masked, of course, takes her hand and says, if I profane with this my unworthiest hand, this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this, my lips two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Now, what he's saying is, um, if I've offended you by touching you, then I will make it all better by kissing you, which you have to admit, as a chat-up line, it's not bad. I mean, you know, he's asking for permission, I suppose, at least. But he didn't ask permission for the handhold. And in Shakespeare's time, they would have danced like this, hand to hand, his holy palm's kiss. But the hands would never have come together. They would never certainly have touched. They would have danced hand to hand like this and turned around in a circle, hand to hand. This would have been Elizabethan dirty dancing. Like this is as hot as it gets until after the wedding night. No hand holding, no touching until after the blessing. But this is pretty hot. Romeo creates quite a social 
commits quite a social taboo by taking Juliet's hand without her permission. This was brought into great clarity for us when we visited the Emirates and I met the uh, um, the woman who was running the theater and in my ignorance I went to shake her hand and she said if you don't mind I, I won't uh, over here the permission to touch is always given from the woman and I said my goodness this is a fantastic rule it should be everywhere in the world I come from the Western world where tactility is almost, you know, is, well, before the last year or so anyway, we're so huggy and there's so many Shakespeare productions where people are, are hugging and shaking hands and, and how immediate was the response in our young children audience at the literature festival we were performing at when they saw our, um, white Romeo touch the hand, take the hand of our non-white Juliet without permission. As Viv said earlier, storytelling and the success of storytelling is very cultural specific and culturally dependent. But great stories will resonate anywhere. I suppose that's why they say that Shakespeare he holds the mirror up to life. He asks us all the time, do you know what this feels like? Do you know what it feels like to be betrayed? Do you? Do you, do you know what it feels like to be in love like this? Do you know what it feels like to grieve like this? Look into the mirror, he invites us. Perhaps that's one of the keys to great storytelling. Back to storytelling ability. And what is it we like about storytelling? Well, as with Shakespeare, it isn't just what you say, but the way that you say it. <clears throat> so, uh, once uh, upon a time in uh, the most uh, distant point in the universe, uh, the, the farthest you can get from Earth without getting closer again, lived a girl who, who looked just like um, uh, my big sister, Lucy. She wouldn't eat her carrots. Once upon a time, there was a boy and the boy lived at the top of a mountain. And that mountain was surrounded by snow every day of the year for all of the boy's life. And the snow was so deep he could never leave the top of the mountain. And he dreamt to leave every day and at the top of the mountain and every morning he would call out and he had the most beautiful singing voice and his song would flow over the snow and across to the distant sunlight land where he dreamed to be. The storytelling qualities that we like are eye contact, I think. We feel connected to, the, to our storyteller. We feel held, we feel comforted, we feel supported. Personalization. I started telling a story off the top of my head about this mountain behind me that I've grown up looking at all of my life. Drama. We like conflict. We like peril. Only not too much peril. Enough peril. Just a minor amount of peril. The idea that this poor lonely boy at the top of a mountain perhaps might uh, although he cannot get to where he wants to, maybe the, his song will somehow get him there. We don't quite know yet. Storytelling lives with play. And it lives with humor. But it really lives with yourself and how much of yourself you're willing to put into it. Now, I have been spending a lot of the last uh, 10 years or so working with 
these. These are Rory's story cubes. And um, I should work for these people the amount that I recommend them. Uh, they are some of the most useful tools I've ever um, had. And um, here they are. They're just nine dice. And you can see that they all have different uh, pictures on them. And I've played this game with um, entrepreneurs and uh, young children, uh, with actors. And uh, there's certainly been a few uh, hours of sitting by the fire with my family, uh, uh, maybe a bottle or two of wine or something, and, um, and these. And there are loads of different ways you can play with them. And they're nothing but provocation. But uh, the two rules that uh, I think are, um, well, the three rules, really, technically, that are most useful. Uh, one is it begins with once upon a time, however that comes in your language. Uh, two, it ends with the end. And three, you've got to think quickly, because what's the point in doing it slowly? So once upon a time, there was a speedometer. God help me. And the speedometer was nestled firmly in the dashboard of a car driven by the world's most famous mushroom. This mushroom was known throughout history for being the fastest driver that the mushroom community had ever, ever known. But the mushroom had a problem, and its problem was that it really, really liked dinosaurs. But of course, mushrooms didn't live in the time of dinosaurs. And no matter where this mushroom drove, he could not find a living, breathing dinosaur. But he had an idea. He would sing a song. And if he sang a song really, really loudly, he believed, he might be able to bring, call a dinosaur to him. Because not many people know that mushrooms have a particular type of singing voice that is incredibly magnetic and alluring to dinosaurs. So the mushroom drove his really, really fast car all the way top to the highest peak of the land and began to sing his song. His song was heard through every city throughout the world and still no dinosaur came his song was heard across mountains and peaks and still no dinosaur came his song was heard all the way through every single trap door in every single house in every single town throughout the world and still no dinosaur came and then finally an elephant came no said the mushroom i didn't want an elephant i wanted a dinosaur it's not my fault said the elephant you sang the elephant song ah said the dinosaur said the mushroom and look behind the elephant and true enough right behind the elephant was every other elephant in the world following up having heard the elephant song can you teach me the dinosaur song said the mushroom of course i can all elephants know the dinosaur song and the, di the elephant sang the dinosaur song for the mushroom the mushroom sang the dinosaur song and out from the very living earth dinosaurs peered from everywhere and finally the mushroom got his wish and light shone throughout the land again and the, and the mushroom was happy the end <laughs> you know what you surprise yourself and i think that's part of the key with these beautiful little tools i mean who would have thought a story about a mushroom and an elephant seeking dinosaurs I mean, where this stuff comes from, I have absolutely no idea. But the thing is, it's about knowing your subject matter. It's about knowing who you're telling a story to. 
it's about preparing. And you can see I'm standing, I'm active, I've warmed my body up, I've warmed my voice up, I've had a little bit of coffee. I've done all the things I need to do to be active and to listen to you. Imagine you out there and to pour my imagination into the moment and into the, the provocation and to allow myself to surprise myself in the moment with how I tell a story. Storytelling is play. And it may be a long time since you've been told a story. It may be a long time since you've played. But I encourage you with all my heart to have a play yourself. And now I invite you to take a breath with me. We'll check out of this session. We'll get uh, Macmillan to come back and uh, have some questions. And if you'd like to reinforce this session with a word about how you're feeling, about how you feel about stories, you're welcome to put it into the chat box there. Thank you for spending some time with me today. And uh, thank you for listening to some stories. I'll be, I'm here for a little longer, so I'll be glad to take any questions you have. Hey, Yanza. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. No? Okay. Let me try again. Oh, he's gone. He'll be back in a minute. Let me see here if I can make this screen a little bigger. Oh, there's some lovely comments here. Thank you so much, everybody. That's really kind. I'm glad you've, uh, I'm glad, <laughs> and that's really nice to read. Can we have a session every day? Listen, I'll tell you what, I'll set up the Zoom room and, um, and, uh, well, I'd say bedtime storytelling, but of course, for some of you, I know it's coming on for bedtime, and some of you, you're just getting up for the day. So, uh, as long as you don't mind um, uh, pan global bedtime storytelling, we can certainly set that up. Um, I, uh, I, I think I, I'm afraid I can't quite see what where the questions are. Ah, we've got Yanza back. Okay, hey Yanza. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Well, we're we're all thrilled. We're all amazed. I think we all want to go and run for our books and start reading. <laughs> I That's want to finish way. this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to go back to, to Shakespeare. I used to read Shakespeare when I was at uh, junior high, and I really loved it. And I believe most people were saying, like, I want to read Shakespeare again. I want to. <laughs> I even wrote, I want to write now. I have some ideas. Well, you know what? If I, I, I had a really bad experience of reading Shakespeare in a book when I was young. And um, mm -hmm. I think uh, because these are pieces of theatre written for um, crafts folk who, who dedicated their lives to performing them, I think it takes quite an imagination, a force of imagination, to be able to read a play and to... To, to, for it to really live but that's why i always suggest people go to the sonnets because you know they're 14 lines there's no plot there's no character to to worry about all there is is space for you and for your heart and your life and your emotions and you can take the first few lines of a sonnet and if you're feeling brave you can take all 14 lines and learn them and then you can go up to someone on the street if you're by yourself, or you can share them with your family and sit down with someone and say, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And see if you can keep them there, you know? Like these, the, the sonnets can be great storytelling exercises if you let them. True. I, uh, well, I got some questions. Please. So, uh, for example, there's a question about, um, how do you get people to tell you stories? I love stories, but I just listen to audios. That's one. Ah. How do we get people to tell stories? Well, um, 
it, it, it feels simple and reductive to say it, but it can be the most courageous thing in the world. And that's to ask. We all have lived a life. We all have a story to tell and to share. But it doesn't take very much for us to feel nervous and insecure and shy and to bail from telling our story. So I've, I've spoken a lot about the qualities of um, storytelling, of course, but the half of great, a great story experience is the quality of listening and of active listening. And if you want to put someone who's perhaps inexperienced or nervous or shy off telling their story, then break eye contact with them, uh, look at your phone, um, look elsewhere, look bored. But if you give them your attention, if you give them your focus, if you push the rest of the world away and genuinely invite them to share their story, what, or even if it's not their story, but you just want them to read to you, then if you, if you are actively listening with all of your being, then that support and comfort and reassurance will see the storyteller through those natural wobbles of nerves and insecurity and shyness. And, um, and you could be, no, 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 I'm here, please, I'm listening, tell me. Uh, and I think, uh, I think all of us need that encouragement from time to time. <laughs> it applies for everything, right? When I we talk so. to our couples, when we talk to our children, when we talk to our students. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I do not understand why these aren't the basic tenets of education, because these are the things that see us through life. But that's a different exactly. soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, most of the audience is just telling you that they love the way you, you tell stories. Your mm. storytelling skills are amazing. They, they say about your intonation, your voice, and everything else. That I mean, no, you, you, get, you, you get your audience, no? You, you're like, oh, I want to know about this. I want to know more about the story. So most of it, it was not questions, but it was it was about the uh, well, the compliments here, as we say in Mexico, te echan flores. No, oh, wow, gosh, gracias. <laughs> oh, I just saw uh, a, a thing there. How can we become better storytellers? Well, and um, I must say, like, I, I, I genuinely do not work for these guys, and you can make your own, of course. You should. I know I should, right? I, I I wrote to them once and said, you know, perhaps we can do a deal here because I'm always promoting you. And they said, no, we're okay. We're doing quite well ourselves. But you can make these yourselves. Um, Rory's do, and um, this is the Voyages theme, so it's very adventure, fairy tale style pictures. But there's there's all sorts of different themes. And what I like about this is, um, you know, you can hand all nine cubes to, to a person next to you or do them yourself or like in a group You can give one cube to each person and then so, you know, I give a, a, a cube to you Yanzo, uh, and it's like let's say it's the jewel there uh -huh, and uh -huh. um, I'm gonna start with uh, well, let's see here uh, These waves and I can say so once upon a time there was a rough rough sea and a pirate aboard it and the pirate and i hand over to you and then you have to carry on the story but make it up with the jewel and then you can pass it around so there are so many ways to 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 to, to practice becoming a great storyteller but the biggest and best tip i can give is to jump off the metaphorical cliff you know, to, uh -huh. to show, like I just did in front of you all there, I, sh I threw myself off by saying once upon a time and just plunged into whatever the next cube was and dragged myself and you all to the end of the most ridiculous story. There is no dignity to be had in great storytelling. There is only play and humor and yourself. And the more of those things you throw in, I, I feel that the more the audience will respond well to it and the more confidence you'll get as you start your storytelling world. And if you're not comfortable improvising, then you know, pick a story that you love. I think it's important if you're gonna read someone else's words that, um, that it's a story that you love that you're familiar with and then when you're sharing it for the first time uh you even if um you're not the best reader your passion for that story will come across to the to the listener yeah amazing prompts there's another uh, question here 
Uh, any advice for using this with preschoolers? Yeah, absolutely. I've um, I've played this game with preschoolers and um, talk about um, starting that spark of creativity and improvisation and game playing at, at, at an age when they're already starting to do these things. Um, I, I would perhaps, uh, uh, you know, I've worked with adults who find some of these pictures, you know, that like that last one with the, 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 the brightness. Some mm -hmm. people call that an idea, some people call it the sun, but t some young minds get a bit stumped by, uh, uh, by those um, sort of uh, uh, indistinct images. So um, I'm, uh, I've seen some books that have story cubes that are much simpler uh, and more appropriate for preschooling age. But, but those kind of visual prompts I feel can be, can be really good starters. Um, I saw someone's comment just then saying uh, uh, that they have a rather croaky voice. Uh, and, and is there something that they can do? Well, um, uh, first of all, I, yes, there is. But first of all, let me say, um, uh, your voice probably doubtless doesn't sound like what you think it sounds like. The way that we hear our voices is through the bones in our face. And if you've ever heard yourself recorded, it usually doesn't sound anything close to what you're used to. But um, um, there are all sorts of things that do damage to your voice. Uh, dairy, so milk, um, is very bad for the vocal cords. Caffeine is very bad for the vocal cords. If I'm doing voice work, I'm gonna be drinking mint tea, usually, that can that's very good for you. Um, if uh, you, your voice feels ragged, then um, a soft and gentle hum, mm, 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 gently warming up the vocal cords, and, and um, hydrating. Hydration is the key to a, a good and solid voice. Um, if your voice catches and, and it feels painful in some way, you might have um, a, a polyp there. Uh, some of my friends in drama school had slightly raspy voices and, and, and you might you know, then, then if you're looking into this more professionally, then it might, and it's a problem for you, or if it's painful, it might be worth getting that checked out. But um, I heartily recommend any of the voice books by um, the great Shakespeare voice teachers, Cicely Berry and Patsy Rodenberg, both do wonderful books on, on voice. I, I believe they all just want to have the kind of, your, of voice you have <laughs> and your skills <laughs> for storytelling. Well, I'm, I have my father to part, in part to thank for that. I've, uh, I've grown <laughs> listening to him give, give talks all yeah, my of life. Course. Of course. Uh, uh, also, they're asking, when did you fall in love with literature? I think since you were very young. <laughs> well, I'm going to be picky here because I don't consider Shakespeare literature. I consider Shakespeare to have been captured and, and imprisoned by literature. Um, I didn't get into Shakespeare until I started to learn some of the theatrical tools to take apart Shakespeare. I really struggled in school to um, to embrace Shakespeare with the literary critical tools that you know we might use to take apart Dickens or Austin. Um, so I fell in love with poetry and then Shakespeare. I didn't really fall in love with literature until my 20s. I, I very distinctly remember coming very late to uh, one of my favorite books now, to Jane Eyre. Um, but I didn't, I, I, I had to study Thomas Hardy in school and I really didn't like that. And, um, and yeah, I hated Shakespeare when he was on the literature shelf. But when I realized that he belonged on the, uh, on the theater shelf, that's when things turned around for me. And then I suppose I got an appreciation for beautiful writing. And then I fell in love with Dickens and Austin and, and Bronte and so on and so forth. So, uh, and Neruda and, and, and all of the other authors. So um, it, uh, it was certainly through Shakespeare, but um, uh, unfortunately it wasn't through the education curriculum that I, I went through. Yes. It happens sometimes. Yeah, but that, you know, <laughs> that gave me a life mission to do what I do. So I'm grateful for it as well. And, and now look at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have another question from uh, a previous uh, part of the session. Uh, it says, do you have practical ideas to introduce and use Shakespeare's plays? 
in teaching A2, B, B1, B2, EFLs, adult, adult classes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, um, uh, get away from books. Um, push the desks to the side of the room if, uh, if you have them. And um, remember that the way that we introduce people to Shakespeare nowadays is usually in a book, on a page, and it is about as far away from the way that Shakespeare would have been received 400 years ago as you could possibly get. Uh, Shakespeare's plays, for the most part, weren't available to buy in print in Shakespeare's time, and his actors wouldn't have had a copy of the play either. They would have been um, handed the prompt copy, uh, and then they would have gone through it. Let's say I'm playing um, uh, Laertes in Hamlet. I'd go to the scene uh, where I'm first enter, and I would write down the cue line to enter, which would be the exit line from the previous scene. And then I would write down my cue of when to speak and then what I speak and then my cue of when next to speak and then what to speak and so on and so forth until the exit. And then I'd flip through to the end of the play when Laertes returns in Act 4 and I wouldn't write down anything else apart from his cue to enter, what to say, when to say it, cue to exit. And uh, the actors would have had these parts like musicians do, you know, the, uh, the third violin in a 72 piece orchestra does not carry around the pieces for the tuba and the double bass and everything else. It's exactly the same in Shakespeare's time. The actors only had their parts. So get away from the books, open up the space, allow people to um, physically explore what it is. How do you stand as a king, a human king? And do you stand differently if you're the king of the fairies? And do you stand differently if you're a witch? Do you stand differently if you're a lover? These are things that you don't have to worry about, language or, or words, but these are the, the these characters are the core part of these plays. And then um, I've, I've been playing around with a great exercise where I take the first scene from Macbeth and um, divide the room into three groups and go over to each group and verbally tell them the and the enter and exit lines and the words that each witch has to speak. And then I go to the next one and they have to write these down because uh, uh, this is what we believe Shakespeare's actors would have done. You, you write down your own words in your own hand and that starts the memorization process too. And then I just uh, I get a drum and I go thunder and lightning, which is the cue for the scene. And everybody jumps up and no one's rehearsed and they don't have anyone else's lines. So they're moving and they're listening. But what they're actually doing is playing. And it's exactly the same with the physicality of taking on a character. We have developed for some reason, I don't really understand a system whereby we teach Shakespeare by sitting down and analyzing a book. And the most successful introduction to Shakespeare I've ever witnessed has been one where play and agency gifts ownership. And if there is an arena for people to play with these works and these characters and excites their energy to the point where they want to then analyze these pieces with literary critical tools, well, surely that analysis would be so much richer for having played and gained the ownership first. Um, that's certainly what I found, and um, uh, th this is uh, Shakespeare on Toast. This is the book I wrote, uh, which is a nice thin little volume and essentially goes through that sort of uh, approach or reframing of Shakespeare away from the literature and, and back towards the, the play. Can you show your book again? Because many people are asking that about your book. <laughs> there it is. The first author to have put Shakespeare on a piece of, well, actually, this is the paperback edition, but the hardback was actually on a piece of toast. This is uh, butter, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it looks like. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you a lot. Believe me, I want to go grab a book. I want to go, <laughs> I want to stop doing this for a moment and go grab a book next That's to right. uh, 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 um, maybe. It and that's it. So thank you, thank you very much. It's been a great really, pleasure. really amazing. Really and amazing. Might, might I just uh, say before I go that uh, I, uh, I, I can only imagine the stress and the strain of the last year for a lot of you teachers out there. And um, 
power and strength to you all for this continued difficult time. And I hope you're all safe and well. And, um, you know, I, I hope these days are, are useful and nourishing to you. And I've, I've certainly enjoyed spending time with you all. And, uh, yeah, my heart to you all for, for the work you, that you, you have ahead of you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.